Section 8.3, Infinite Series. Uh, let's start out by looking at an example to illustrate where we're going here. Let me look at this simple sum of 1 plus 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth plus 1 thirty second and so on, where the and so on part is that set of ellipsis points at the end, which means I continue the sum indefinitely following the same progression, meaning the next few terms would be 1 64th, 1 1 28th, 1 2 56, where basically the denominator of each successive term is double the denominator of the previous term. All right, of course, obviously I know how to compute a finite sum. The question is, what does it mean when I add indefinitely? And for starters, let's just use the simple illustration of I'm in a room with a floor and a ceiling. And let's say I'm adding things, and let's say I visualize that by throwing things on a stack. So I add one, I add one half, I add one quarter. So I'm throwing things on the stack, let's say that have a certain thickness. Okay, notice that these things I'm adding are decreasing quite rapidly in their thickness or their size, which means as I throw them on this stack, the stack is increasing in size, but obviously it's slowing down in how tall it's getting. And the first question would be, well, even though I'm going to add things to the stack indefinitely, is there a limit actually to how tall the stack can be since these things I'm adding are getting so small? And if the answer is yes, if there is a limit to how tall the stack can get even though I'm adding an infinite number of things, then this infinite sum is actually going to have a limit to how big it can get. Um, in fact, it may not even get as big as the ceiling. Maybe it never reaches this height. And of course you can understand that that height we're talking about would be the least upper bound. The more and more I add, the closer I would get to that least upper bound. But if I can never reach it, I'm going to say that this infinite sum equals that value in the sense that the more terms I add, the closer and closer it gets and increases to that least upper bound sum. All right, now, this particular example I'm starting with here, you, you may recall this from Calc 1, where we used to talk about the example of the, you know, the room that was two units wide. So this is zero and this is two. And we talked about, uh, you know, walking half of the distance from the left end to the right end, which meant this distance was one. And then we said once you make it to the halfway point, what would happen if we walked half of the remaining distance? Well, of course, half that remaining distance would be one half. And then what would happen if I walked half of that remaining distance? Well, that would be half of one half, which would be one quarter. And then if I continue doing this, infinitely walking half of the remaining distances at each step in this process, then of course, in that next one, I would move one eighth and the next one 1 16th, and then 1 32nd, and so on. And intuitively, I can, I can get the idea in this picture that even if I walk an infinite number of steps, if the step size is decreasing by half each time, then I'm never actually going to make it to 2. I will get closer and closer to 2. So in that sense, my guess is that when I add up 1 plus 1 half plus 1 quarter, plus one eighth plus one sixteenth and continue that indefinitely, uh, the limit there, let's say, is two. That is, I will never actually reach two, but it does look like from this picture I will get closer and closer to two. Okay, if that's the case, I'm going to say this infinite summation is exactly equal to two. Okay, let's let's put a formal definition on this just so that we have a, a concrete definition to use. Suppose a sub n is a 
non-negative sequence of real numbers let's define s sub 1 to be a1 let's define s sub 2 to be a sub 1 plus a sub 2 let's define a sub 3 to be a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3. Let me skip down here a little bit. So that means if I asked what's s sub 10, I'm saying it would be the sum of the first 10 terms in the a sub n sequence. Notice that when the number of terms in this sum I'm defining gets larger, it might be convenient to write this as a summation. Uh, so by the way, this is the time to mention my summations are pretty sloppy. So just to remind everybody uh, about the summations you saw in Calc 1, obviously if I took the time to draw it nicely, that's the sigma sim symbol for summations. Uh, I'm going to be a little sloppy and just write something that looks like that. But notice this summation would be n equals 1 to 10 a sub n. And so generally what I'm saying is we're going to define s sub n, which would be a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 all the way up through a sub n to be the summation k equals 1 to n a sub k. And I'm going to call this the nth partial sum of the infinite series summation n equals 1 to infinity a sub n. Okay, so a couple of things to unpack there. First of all, when I write this thing, which again I am calling an infinite series, Okay, series means sum, and obviously infinite is referring to this infinity up here, which says I'm going to add these up, the elements in this sequence, forever, like what we were talking about above. And what I've defined up here with this S sub n is S sub n is the partial sum of the first n terms. So, for example, if I add a few more terms to my sum down here. Let's say a sub 4 plus a sub 5 plus a sub 6 dot dot dot. Then I'm saying s sub 3 is the sum k equals 1 to 3 a sub k which is just the sum of the first three terms in this infinite series. And so you see why I'm using the word partial. It's not the entire infinite sum. It's just a partial sum where I've selected the first n terms, or in this case, the first three terms. So just to recap here, this would be the first partial sum, the second partial sum, the third partial sum, the tenth partial sum, and in general, the nth partial sum. Uh, notice the connection between these partial sums is very simple. To get from one partial sum to the next, you're just adding the next term. In other words, what is s sub 2? It's just s sub 1 plus a sub 2. What's s sub 3? It's the second partial sum, which is just a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus the next term. So obviously there's a recursive relationship between these partial sums. To get from one to the next, I just add the next term in my sequence. Okay, so now that we've got that definition, now we can say what it means for an infinite series to actually add up to something. So definition will say that the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n converges to L, uh, and we'll denote that 
by saying that the summation n equals 1 to infinity a sub n equals l. Now, just remember when I say equals here, we already know that when I add up an infinite number of numbers, there's no end to that process, so I can't actually equal something exactly. So when I say the infinite series equals a value, I'm really talking about convergence to that value. And the definition I'm going to use, actually let me erase my red parts here. I'm going to say that this series converges to L if the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n equals L, i.e. the limit as n goes to infinity of the partial sum, the nth partial sum, which we said was k equals 1 to n a sub k equals L. In other words, if I say s sub 1 is a sub 1 and I say s sub 2 is the sum of the first two terms and s sub 3 is the sum of the first three terms and then in general again s sub n is the sum of the first n terms we're saying that if we look at not the sequence of the a's but we look at the sequence of these partial sums so pay attention here because this is a this is a little abstract. We are looking at this now as its own sequence. So if I look at the S1, S2, S3, S4, that is also a sequence. I'm building those partial sums out of these AK numbers. And again, we know how we're getting to each one of these. We're just adding the next term. Well, if I look at this as a sequence, and I see that that sequence converges to something, then that's going to be the same as saying that our infinite series equals or converges to that number. Which makes sense because if I think about this sequence converging, it means that as I add an extra term to my previous partial sum, if I keep doing that over and over again, we're saying if this sum is getting closer and closer to L, then that is our reasonable definition for what it means to say the infinite series converges to that L. All right, so what we've done here is come up with a working definition for what it means to say an infinite series converges. And let me restate it one more time just for clarity. We're saying if n equals 1 to infinity, a sub n equals L, this means that the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn equals L, where S sub n is that nth partial sum built out of those same AKs or ANs that my infinite series is built out of. Notice what it means to say the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn equals L, that means, of course, that if I'm given epsilon greater than 0, there is some integer value n, capital N, such that if n is sufficiently large, then we're saying this sequence element minus that limit is less than epsilon. And of course, we've seen this many times before. If we say this sequence converges to this number, then it simply means that when I make n big enough, and this big n is how big, then I can make my sequence as close as I want to the limit. OK, now of course, what is this s sub n? It's the partial sum for my infinite series. And we're basically saying that if we add up enough terms in that infinite series, that is at least big n terms, then I know my sum 
will be as close as I want it to that limit value. And we know the old story, what happens if I make this epsilon smaller? Then it probably means I'm going to have to make this big N bigger, which just means I'm going to have to add on more terms in my partial sum. But that's the whole essence of an infinite series. I can make that infinite sum get as close as I want to this value by simply adding more terms to the partial sum. And if I'm always able to do that, that's what it means to say the infinite series converges. Okay, let's apply this to our example just to see it working. Uh, so I'm talking about our example of the 1 plus the 1 half plus the 1 quarter plus the 1 eighth plus the 1 sixteenth and so on. So back to this example. So one of the challenging things sometimes with series like this, and it, it won't be very difficult for this one, but it can sometimes be difficult, is to analyze what this infinite sum is doing. It would be very helpful if I could write a formula for what these terms are doing. And I need to start by sort of thinking about this being the first term, this being the second term, this being the third term, and the fourth term, and the fifth term, and so on. Uh, because if I'm going to track these terms by calling them a sub something, 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 I need a way to connect the index of the term that I'm on with what's happening with the actual expression. Because remember, a sequence is a function of the natural number. So the form that these expressions are taking depends on n being 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5. So the first question uh, I would put to you is, can I come up with a formula that says what a sub n is in general when I look at the pattern in these terms? And so what I'm asking is a little bit of uh, pattern recognition here. It's not necessarily anything deep mathematically. It's just a question of if I know n equals 1 gets me 1, and I know n equals 2 gets me 1 half, and n equals 3 gets me 1 fourth, and so on, is there a way I can come up with a formula for all of those that depends solely on n? And I say this one isn't that hard because as you look at it for a minute, of course, the first thing you realize is I'm just doubling those denominators each time, which means those are powers of 2. In particular, this one is 2 to the first. This denominator is 2 squared. This denominator is 2 cubed. This one's 2 to the fourth. And as I look at this power and this n value, and this power and this n value, and so on, then I think I've probably figured out the pattern. So each of these is a fraction that looks like 1 over a power of 2. And when n is 2, my power is 1. When n is 3, my power is 2, and so on. Meaning, in each case, it looks like the power on the 2 is 1 less than this index value. So my guess is this should be 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. Now, does that also work when n equals 1? If n was equal to 1, this would be a sub 1 equals 1 over 2 to the 0, which would be 1, which is exactly what I've got for that first term. So I'd say a sub n equals 1 over 2 to the n minus 1 will do it. Meaning, I can write this 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth infinite sum using summation notation, where I'm saying it's n equals 1 to infinity 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. Let me clean that up just a little bit.
All right, now, what is the most basic way I can try and analyze an infinite series or infinite sum to determine if it converges or not? Well, I'll go back to the basic definition, which is to look at the sequence of partial sums. Okay, what is the nth partial sum? It's the sum of the first n terms in that sum. Now, notice I am uh, playing with these index variables. Obviously, if I want to fix this n value, which is how many terms in my partial sum, that has to be the upper limit in this summation, which means I have to use a different variable for that counter. And of course, that's the k that's changing over here in the terms in this partial sum. All right, so I've got my nth partial sum, and what do I have to check? to see if this infinite series converges. I have to look at the limit of this sequence of partial sums. Now, this is the part that can sometimes be tricky, uh, but I've selected a nice example here to show you uh, how you can try and piece this together. So let's, let's look at a few of these partial sums for this particular summation. So what is the first partial sum? It's 1. What's the second partial sum? It's the sum of the first two terms. What's the third partial sum? It's 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth, which if you add those up, you'll see that's 7 fourths. What's S sub 4? Of course, that would be 1 plus 1 half plus one quarter plus one eighth and if you add those up you'll see that's 15 eighths here I'll throw one more in if you check s sub 5 you'll see that's 31 over 16 now one of the obvious things I could try to do to figure out what this sequence of partial sums looks like is to figure out is there a nice pattern to the sequence of partial sums itself. Because if there was, taking the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n would be much easier if I could actually write something for s sub n. Well, in green there, I've highlighted what the s sub n's look like. 1, 3 halves, 7 fourths, 15 eighths, 31 sixteenths. So it's back to the pattern recognition question again. And let me just write this off to the side. We're saying that when n is 1, we get a partial sum of 1. When n is 2, we're getting a partial sum of 3 halves. When n is 3, we're getting a partial sum of 7 fourths. When n is 4, 15 eighths. Uh, and then finally, when n is 5, we're getting 31 sixteenths. All right, so again, a little bit of pattern recognition. Do I see a connection between the index value and the denominator? The index value and the denominator. Index value and denominator. Well, again, those denominators are powers of 2. And I can see that this 8 right here is 2 cubed, which is 1 less than 4. This 4 is 2 squared, which is 1 less than 3. This 2 is 2 to the first, which is 1 less than 2. So it looks to me like the denominator is 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, what about the numerator? So for that, let me change colors. And I'm thinking about what's the connection between n equals 2 and 3 n equals 3 and 7, n equals 4 and 15, n equals 5 and 31. Well, if you don't spot it right away, let me just point out to you that if you add 1 to each of those numerators, you'll get, and let me switch colors again, you'll get 4, you'll get 8, you'll get 16, you'll get 32 which are all powers of 2. In fact, 
if I look at that last one of 31 and I add 1 to it, which would make 32, notice that would be 2 to the 5th, which would be 1 power larger than the, I'm sorry, which would be exactly the power I'm on. Okay, what if I add 1 to the 15 right here and I get 16? That's 2 to the 4th. So I think each of those numerators is actually a power of 2, take away 1. All right, so a little bit of deduction, and I figured out that this appears to be the formula for my partial sum. So now I just take the limit as n goes to infinity of that partial sum. Uh, notice that is limit n goes to infinity. Looks like it's 1 half minus 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. And I know that as n goes to infinity, this part's going to go to 0, which means I'm going to get a limit of and may oops, let's make that a two, and I get a limit of two, which of course is what I have been thinking all along about this sum, one over two to the n minus one, that it should be adding up to that value of two. Okay, so this example shows you, first of all, how we define convergence for an infinite series. Uh, we definitely have a basic delta epsilon type definition, or epsilon n definition. And now you've got an example to show you how I can actually look at the sequence of partial sums. And if it's simple enough, and I'm lucky enough to come up with a pattern and a formula for what this nth partial sum looks like, and I will say that often it's, it's very difficult or impossible to actually come up with this formula. So that means we're going to be limited in, in what we can do with this sometimes. But in the event I can come up with such a formula, all I have to do is take the limit as n goes to infinity of that formula that represents that nth partial sum. If that limit exists, that is the value of my infinite series. If this limit does not exist, then I would say this infinite series diverges. So just to make that explicit, we're saying if the limit as n goes to infinity of that sequence of partial sums does not exist, then we say the infinite series diverges. All right, so that means the first thing we need to do is try to figure out, are there some easy series, like basic types, canonical types, for which we know how and when convergence will happen? And even better, are there series for which we can actually calculate the values like we did in this example? And so the first one we're going to start with, the first type, is probably the most famous kind of infinite series. It's geometric series, so infinite geometric series. And so we're talking about things that look like, let's say, n equals 0 to infinity r to the n. Or actually, I'll switch to k, because I think in your book he likes to use k for this. So I'll say k equals 0 r to the k. Now, I, I did something there to you. You notice I've changed this lower limit on the index. Okay, and the definitions I've given you for an infinite series, there's nothing sacred about the starting value for that index. If you notice when I write this out, this is going to be r to the 0 plus r to the 1 plus r squared plus dot 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 dot. Um, what would it look like if I started it at 1? Well, it would be the same thing, except it would start at 1. Um, 
what if we had k equals 1 to infinity r to the k minus 1? Well, when k is 1, that would be r to the 0. When k is 2, that would be r to the first. k is 3, that would be r squared, and so on. So you can see, actually, these two series are the same thing. So part of this shows you that I can represent a series in summation notation in different ways. It's essentially the same basic formula, except I have shifted things to compensate for where I'm starting that lower index value. And I'll show you how to deal with, it, with that specifically here in a minute. But this just shows you there's nothing necessarily sacred about starting these infinite series with a lower index value of 1. Uh, they can be started anywhere. Uh, from this last example, you should see that if I had k equals 1, um, actually, let me, let me say we had k equals 52 to infinity blank. If I wanted that to equal r to the 0 plus r to the first plus r squared plus dot dot dot, you should see that if I wrote this as r to the k minus 52, then I would get exactly the same sum that we were getting before. So I can write the same sum in many different ways just by playing with this index value and then shifting appropriately with my function notation. All right, now let's go back to our basic form that we normally write for a geometric series. And the custom usually is to start this at 0. And I'll switch to k. And again, of course, this is r to the 0 plus r to the first plus r squared, and so on. And of course, I realize that that first term is just 1. OK, obviously, based on what we've said so far, to get a handle on whether or not an infinite series converges, I need to look at the sequence of partial sums. So let me look at the nth partial sum for this geometric series, okay, which would just be the sum k equals 0 to n. Now that's actually n plus 1 terms because I'm starting at 0, but that's okay. I'm going to call that the nth partial sum. And with that notation, again, you'll notice if this is r0 plus r1 plus r squared plus r cubed and so on, uh, you can see that the first term is r to the 0, which would be when k is 0. So using this notation, you can see that the first partial sum is actually s sub 0. And then the next partial sum is s sub 1. And then the second one, well, it's actually the third partial sum, but it's when n is 2, is 1 plus r plus r squared. And s sub 3 is 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed. Now, if you don't like the idea of the s sub 0, that's fine, because what did we just say a minute ago? You can write this as k equals 1 to infinity r to the k minus 1. And if you prefer it, that's fine to write it that way. Then you could actually say s sub 1, if you like to refer to that as the first partial sum, would be r to the 0. And the second partial sum, s sub 2, would be r to the 0 plus r to the first, and so on. Uh, both of these are fine. Uh, I'm going to use this version, even though it uses this peculiar s0. Uh, but here's, here's the thing for you to think about. Does it really matter what happens to that partial sum for a small value like k equals 0? Is that really going to have anything to do with the convergence? The convergence is really determined by what happens to this sequence as n gets bigger and bigger. So how I index these terms early on for small k values won't really make any difference. The question is, what's going to happen to this sequence in the long run. So don't let this bother you, me calling that s sub 0. The real question is, what happens to this sequence? Does it converge or does it diverge?
and so using my notation I've got s sub n is 1 plus r plus r squared up through r to the n. All right, let's just detach the s sub n from that for a minute, and let's just call it s, just to make it simple. So I have a power of the first, or a sum of the first n plus 1 powers of r. r the 0, r the first, up through r the nth. Let me do a little trick here. Let's take that same sum and let's multiply it by r, which of course means what I'm really doing is just multiplying both sides of this equation by r. And of course, when I do that, what do I get? I get r plus r squared plus r cubed plus dot 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 dot. And if that last one gets multiplied by r, it becomes r the n plus 1. All right, now let's do something really simple, which is to subtract these two. These are both finite sums, so I can do regular algebra on them. And if I do that with these two, I get s minus r s is equal to. And if you notice what happens there, when I take this top line minus this second line, you should notice that this minus this r means the r's are gone. This r squared minus this r squared, this r cubed minus this r cubed, all the way up to this rn minus the rn in the second line, which is the next to the last term. And now that I've subtracted all those, what's left? Well, the only thing that's left is this 1 and this r to the n plus 1, which means I have 1 minus r to the n plus 1. Now, a little quick algebra tells me that this is s times 1 minus r equals 1 minus r to the n plus 1, which means s, which is the finite sum I started with, is 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. And now to reinsert our partial sum notation, this is actually the formula for this partial sum of our geometric series that we started with. And what did we say about what we have to do to try and figure out convergence or divergence of this infinite series? We need to take the limit as n goes to infinity of that partial sum, which in this case means limit as n goes to infinity of 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. Remember, r is a constant. So that denominator, 1 minus r, is just a constant. In fact, the only thing that's variable and moving with the limit is this r to the n plus 1 part. OK, very simply, we know that if the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1, this limit is infinite. That is, if the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1, when I take the limit right here, I'm going to get infinity. And actually, let me uh, correct something there. If the limit, or if the absolute value of r is strictly bigger than 1, then the limit is infinite. Think about it. If this r is greater than 1, and you start raising it to larger and larger powers, it's going to blow up. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Meanwhile, the other parts in this expression are staying constant. OK, what if the absolute value of r is equal to 1? Then, of course, the whole thing is 0 over 0, which is undefined. OK, the only other question is, what happens if the absolute value of r is less than 1? Well, again, same logic. If I have r to the n plus 1, and that r is something whose absolute value is less than 1, like, say, 1 half, then I know when I raise a number like that to a power that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the limit of that sort of progression is 0. All right, so putting that all together,
what I have is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 minus r of the n plus 1 over 1 minus r exists if and only if the absolute value of r is less than 1. And in fact, we can say if the absolute value of r is less than 1, then the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r is 1 over 1 minus r, because we just said this part would have a limit of 0. OK, putting that all back together, if the infinite series n equals 0 to infinity r to the n, or I guess I said I was going to switch to k, so I'll do that. If the value of that infinite series is determined by the limit of the sequence of partial sums, and we're saying that when that absolute value of r in that sequence is less than 1, we get a limit of the sequence of partial sums being 1 over 1 minus r, then that is the value of this infinite series provided the absolute value of r is less than 1. And again, we're saying that this infinite geometric series diverges if the absolute value of that r is greater than or equal to 1. So as I said before, this is probably the most important and simplest type of convergent infinite series. And of course, one of the nice things is it's very easy to calculate because we have such an easy formula for it. So let's look at a number of examples. In fact, we can uh, go back and look at the example we already worked on, which was that 1 plus 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth series, which we said was summation. We could write it as k equals 0 to infinity 1 over 2 to the k. And just check that to make sure that when k is 0 and k is 1 and k is 2, that I get these terms. And of course, I recognize right away that this is a geometric series. It's precisely k equals 0 to infinity 1 half to the k. That means r is 1 half. And that number is often called the common ratio. Uh, but clearly, that value is less than 1, which means this is definitely a convergent geometric series. And my formula says it should be equal to 1 over 1 minus r, which in this case would be 1 over 1 half, which would be 2, which confirms what we found earlier. All right, so that means I just have to be on the lookout for geometric series and recognize them when I see them. So how about something like infinite series n equals 0 to infinity 3 to the minus n? Well, of course, I know that that's really just n equals 0 to infinity 1 over 3 to the n. And I recognize that that is really just one third to the n, which, according to my formula, should be 1 over 1 minus r, where I recognize one third is that common ratio number. That would be 1 over 2 thirds. That would be 3 halves. Let's try infinite series n equals 1 to infinity, 2 over 5 to the n. All right, now if I just wrote out a few terms, I can see that would be 2 over 5 plus 2 over 25 plus 2 over 125 and so on. So it's 2 over a progression of powers of 5. Um, one thing that's interesting, if you note, there's really just a two-fifth embedded in all of those. And if you factored it out, what would be left? There'd be a one. There'd be a one-fifth. 
there would be a 1 25th, which would actually, actually be 1 over 5 squared. Uh, the next one would actually be 1 over 5 cubed. So by factoring out the greatest common factor, I can see actually right there is a simple geometric series. Actually, what is this? It's 2 fifths times the series k equals 0 to infinity, 1 fifth to the k, since 1 fifth is the common ratio. That would be 2 fifths times 1 over 1 minus 1 fifth, which would be 2 fifths times 1 over 4 fifths. So what do we have? 2 fifths times 5 fourths. We actually get 1 half out of that. All right, now let me, let me take a minute to look at this problem in a slightly different way, although I should certainly remember this little trick that we just used here in factoring out that greatest common factor. But let me uh, look at this again in a slightly different way. So let's redo this example. So again, it's summation k, oops, k equals 1 to infinity, 2 over 5 to the n. First of all, I know from finite sum arithmetic from Calc 1 that we can pull constants outside of sums. And we'll just say that here that we can do that. I'll list it as a property later. But we can definitely pull constant multiples outside of sums. So I can pull that 2 outside the summation, which leaves 1 over 5 to the n. Now, it's unnecessary to do this for this for this example because you saw me just solve it pretty easily on the page before. But I want to uh, take this example to introduce the idea of re-indexing, which is, let me write that a little better, which is a really important idea. So re-indexing. All right, so let me take this sum. And I recognize that it has geometric form, but if I'm trying to match it with my formula that says when I have k equals 0 to infinity, r of the k equals 1 over 1 minus r, the problem, of course, is, of course, that my formula starts with 0. It doesn't start with 1. All right, so re-indexing is how I can manipulate series like we were talking about earlier, where I do the shifting to compensate for changing that index value. And here's basically how I do it. So let's say I have this k equals 1 to infinity, 1 over 5 to the k. And this should have been a k up here. All right, so what I'd like, obviously, is for this to be k equals 0, if I'm going to try and match this summation for me over here. All right, so how can I do that? Well, here's, here's the formal way to do it. I could let k equal, let's say, m plus 1. Now, if I do that, what happens to this summation? Well, if the k is m plus 1, then now that index equation on the bottom of the sum becomes m plus 1 equals 1. OK, what happens to the infinity? Well, it's still going to be infinity. Offsetting the counter by 1 is not going to change the fact that this is still an infinite sum that goes to infinity. What happens inside the sum? I have to change that k to an m plus 1. OK, now that I've written down this equation in that lower index spot, you should see why I chose to let k equal m plus 1. I chose k to be m plus this value so that when I solve this equation, I actually force it to start at 0, which means now this sum is summation m equals 0 to infinity 1 over 5 to the m plus 1. Now, you understand, of course, that this m and this k are definitely not the same variable. They're, they're obviously separated by 1. But here's where it's very common, especially in computer science, where 
there are a lot of manipulations done on summations like this to be kind of lazy and just change that back to the original variable. And it's not really lazy. Uh, actually, if I was writing a program, what I would say at this point is first I let k equal m plus 1, and then after I rewrote my sum, I went back and I let k equal m. Because then when I'm writing a program, I can definitely redefine the same variable over and over again in the same program. All right, so if you notice here, you can be really super lazy. And this is what computer science people do all the time. When they go to re-index this sum, as in k equals 1 to infinity, 1 over 5 to the k, they don't even bother using this auxiliary variable m. They just say, let's suppose k equals k plus 1. And then they substitute k plus 1 in place of that k. And that gives them k plus 1 equals 1 to infinity, 1 over 5 to the k plus 1. And then they solve this for k and get k equals 0. Formally, of course, this is incorrect because you're really needing to create a, a second variable to do this substitution. But then since I'm able to relabel that m as a k again, uh, it actually does, or it does end up being equivalent to just using k for the whole thing. So I'm going to follow that computer science tradition when I do these re-indexings and just be lazy. So that means when I have the summation k equals 1 to infinity 1 over 5 to the k, I'm just going to resubstitute that k with a k plus 1 which means I'm changing all of the k's to k plus 1's. And then, of course, why did I choose k plus 1? It was so that when I solved this little indexing equation, I got k equals 0, which means now I'm looking at the sum k equals 0 to infinity 1 over 5 to the k plus 1. Notice that is k equals 0 to the infinity, to infinity 1 over 5 times 1 over 5 to the k, which means I can pull out a 1 fifth because that's a constant, constant multiple. What's left inside the sum is 1 over 5 to the k, which of course is just 1 fifth to the k. And now you should recognize that with my manipulations, this is a basic geometric series uh, set up to apply my formula exactly. That is, the answer should be 1 fifth times 1 over 1 minus r. And then, of course, there's my 1 fifth times my 5 fourths. And there's my 1 fourth. And don't forget, this problem had a 2 in front of it originally, which is why we got a 1 half answer. All right, so this gives you an idea of how I can re-index, meaning I can re-index that bottom value and have this infinite series start wherever I want it to be. And of course, oftentimes it is convenient to make it start at zero. So this is why I mentioned before, if I have something like, say, summation k equals 5 to infinity ak, it sometimes is going to be convenient for me to re-index this so that the series starts at zero. And what I'm suggesting to you is the way to do it is to replace that k by a k plus 5, which means now this series becomes k equals 0 to infinity. And of course, the place I've compensated for that is by shifting the ak's by 5. So this is the idea of re-indexing. And if I'm trying to match a simple formula that requires a certain form, re-indexing often gets me there. So what if I had, just for another quick example, what if I had n equals 4 to infinity 0.3 to the n, which I recognize right away is n equals 4 to infinity 3 tenths to the n, 
where my common ratio is less than 1, so this should be convergent geometric, except I know it's not 1 over 1 minus 3 tenths, because that's what I would get if this actually started at 0. So you should notice an, another way you can do this is you could say this is the sum n equals 0 to infinity, 3 tenths to the n, minus the terms that happen when n is 0, n is 1, n is 2, and n is 3. In other words, when n is 0, I get 1. When n is 1, I get 3 tenths. When n is 2, I get 9 over 100. When n is 3, I get 27 over 1,000. And so if I calculate this guy, which I know is 1 minus, oops, 1 over 1 minus 3 tenths, and I subtract these four numbers, that will get me the value of our sum. That's a lot of messing around, though. I mean, it's, it's doable. It's not too bad. Uh, there are only four terms you had to subtract, so if... If this uh, 4 was a larger number, I might have to do more of this. Okay, this is where we can use re-indexing to make things a lot simpler. So let's go back to our problem right there. So how do I want to re-index this if this is starting at 4? I just want to replace that n with an n plus 4, which means the interior of that sum becomes 3 tenths to the n plus 4. And now when I rewrite that index equation, it is n equals 0 to infinity. Notice that I can write this part as 3 tenths to the fourth times 3 tenths to the n, which means when I put that all together, I've got 3 tenths to the fourth as a common multiplier that I can pull outside the summation times n equals 0 to infinity 3 tenths to the n. Okay, and of course, what does that make? That makes 81 over 1,000, actually 10,000, times 1 over 1 minus 3 tenths. So whatever that is, uh, 1 minus 3 tenths would be 7 tenths, so that's 10 sevenths, which means I end up with 81 over 7,000, if I did my arithmetic correctly there. Okay, so another example to show you how re-indexing can make things easier, especially when it comes to these geometric series that have been transformed just a little bit. Okay, let's talk about another famous application of geometric series, and that would be repeating decimals. That is, rational numbers that are represented by infinitely repeating decimals. So, of course, I know with the bar over there that that means threes forever. Um, two things to say about that. Uh, if you've seen the old proof in algebra about why this is exactly one-third, uh, you remember why this is one-third. If you haven't seen it before, we can say it very quickly. If I said x was equal to 0.3 repeating, that of course implies that 10x is equal to 3.3 repeating. That's just moving the decimal place one place to the right. Uh, notice this right side is just 3 plus 0.3 repeating. But on this line up here, what did I call 0.3 repeating? I called it x, which means I have 9x equals 3, which means x is 3 ninths, which is 1 third. All right, so I don't need infinite series to prove to myself that 0.3 repeating is 1 third, uh, but Let's look at this point 0.3 repeating for a minute and dig into what it is. So, of course, I know it's precisely a point 0.3 plus a point 0.03 plus a point 0.003 and so on, right? Uh, 
if I stack these up on top of each other where I have the 0.3 and I have the 0.03 and I have the 0 .003 and so on, then of course if I make an infinite series out of that and add up each decimal position, I'm going to get threes in each spot. All right, now when I write it that way, immediately I recognize this is an infinite series. And in fact, if I write out what these are, this is 3 tenths. This is obviously 3 over 100. This is 3 over 1,000, and so on. In fact, what did we say before? When you have an infinite series like this, uh, one of the first things you should think about is, are there common factors? Is there a common factor? Three-tenths is definitely a common factor. What's left is one plus one-tenth plus one over a hundred. This next one would be three over ten thousand, which means the next term would be one over a thousand. And I recognize right away that inside the brackets what I have there is a one plus a one-tenth plus a one-tenth squared plus a one-tenth cubed and so on which is definitely a simple geometric series where my common ratio is 10 which means my summation should be three-tenths times 1 over 1 minus r, where r is the common ratio of 1 tenths. Okay, what does that give me? 3 tenths times 1 over 9 tenths, which is 3 tenths times 10 ninths, which is 3 ninths, which is 1 third. All right, so all of your repeating decimals can be handled this way. Um, in fact, let's do one other example. Uh, before we move on to the next kind of series. So you can certainly handle something like 0.1357 where the 57 is repeating in a similar way to what I did on the previous page with this algebraic approach. It's, it's a bit trickier. It certainly just uses basic algebra though. Uh, but actually this is the case where it might be a little easier with infinite series. So again Let's write out what this guy is. He is 0.13, where it's only the five sevens that are repeating. All right, I know the 0.13 doesn't really have anything to do with the divergence or convergence of this infinite series that I'm going to get. It's really what happens with the five sevens. And of course, if I look at that one right there, I recognize that that's a 5, 7 in the third and fourth decimal places, which means this is 57 over 1 followed by 4 zeros, so 10 thousandths. If I look at the next two, this is again where I'm looking at this as, let me just say out to the side here, 0.13 plus 0 0.0057 plus 0 0.000057 and then when I get out to this one it would be plus 0 0.000057 and so 57 over 10,000 is this one. What's this next one? It would be 57 over 1 followed by 6 zeros. We had 4 zeros here now we just want two more, so millionth, plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, obviously, again, the 0 0.13, which is 13 over 100, is not really involved in this part, which is the part I want to look at. What's the common factor? Well, it's actually that 57 over 10,000. What's left when you factor that out? Well, it starts with a 1. And then what's left out of this part? Well, the only thing we said we added to that was two more zeros in the denominator, which would be 1 over 100. What would I add to the denominator to get the next term? It would be two more zeros, which would be 1 over 10,000. But that's really just 1 over 100 squared.
So actually the next term is the next power of 100. And the next term is the next power of 100. This is definitely a geometric series with a common ratio of 1 one hundredth. So this gives me what? 13 tenths plus 57 over 10,000 times infinite series n equals 0 to infinity 1 over 100 to the n. 13, and this should be 13 over 100 up here, plus 57 over 10,000 times, well, I don't really need brackets there because what's it going to be? It should be 1 over 1 minus r. So this would be 13 over 100 plus 57 over 10,000 times 1 over 99 over 100, which would be 100 over 99. Obviously, I can cancel out this 100 with, let's say, well, not that one, with two of these zeros, which means I end up with 13 over 100 plus 57 over 9900. Uh, so that means I have, what, 13 times 99 plus 57 over 9900, which should give you 1344 over 9900 if I punch that in the calculator correctly. All right, so this is one of the more basic applications of geometric series, one that you'll see a few times in your homework. But we can definitely tear apart any repeating decimal now with any sort of pattern, no matter where the blocks are, uh, by treating them as some form of a geometric series. All right, as promised, there are two basic types of infinite series that we look at in this section. So geometric is the most important. Um, a distant second, but still something that comes up once in a while, and it is one of the, the few forms that has a nice closed formula, and they're called telescoping series. And you'll see where the name comes from here in a second. So we're talking about series that look like, let's say, n equals 1 to infinity, um, a sub n minus a sub n plus 1. So the general term looks like the difference of a sequence number and the next number in that same sequence. So we are saying that a sub n is a sequence here, and really we usually assume that that a sub n is a sequence of non-negative numbers. And we're talking about series that have this special form where the general term looks like the difference of two consecutive numbers in the same sequence. So I'll give you one example of this just to show you um, how this works because you really only do need to see one example. Uh, but before I show you the, the specific example, let's just look at what this is doing. So if I wrote out what this looks like, well, it certainly looks like A1 minus A2. That's when n is 1. When n is 2, it would be plus a2 minus a3. When n is 3, it would be plus a3 minus a4. OK, let's say I continue that process up to the nth term. So the next one, or the last term, would be a n minus a n plus 1. Okay, note if n is odd, s sub n is equal to a sub 1. And just remember, when I say s sub n, I'm talking about the nth partial sum, which is what we just wrote up there. So the nth partial sum would be s a would be the first term in my sum plus the second term in my sum up through the nth term. Well, here is the first term in my sum. There's the second one. There's the third one. 
and here's the nth term. So that is my nth partial sum. Notice that if n is odd, and of course when I'm trying to figure out things like this, I could just write out something. If I was looking at, say, s sub 3, what would that be? It'd be a1 minus a2 plus a2 minus a3 plus a3 minus a4. Here, let's do another one just to compare. What would S5 be? It'd be the same thing. Except I would add on one more term, which would be A sub 4 minus A sub 5, and then I would add on one more term after that, which would be A sub 5 minus A sub 6. All right, you should notice in the case of an odd indexed partial sum, that is when n is odd, uh, what happens for this finite sum in this first line? It looks like these even ones cancel out, these odd ones cancel out, and what I'm left with is just the first term and the last term. Okay, notice S5, and I did that one just to do another one, just to make sure that we're correct about this pattern. It looks like after the first term, there are consecutive pairs. If I group it with those two together and those two together and those two together and those two together, that those all cancel pairwise. And then what I'm left with is just, again, the first term and the last term. Okay, that's if n is odd. What happens if n is even? Now, by the way, I didn't uh, finish what I started to write up here. So what's my conjecture? If n is odd, what should s sub n look like? Uh, s sub 3 was a1 minus a4. s sub 5 was a1 minus a6. So what formula should I have up here? s sub n should be a1 minus a sub n plus 1. When n was 3, my last term was minus a4. When n was 5, my last term was minus a6. Okay, what if n is even? So my question is, uh, what will s sub n look like if n is even? Well, again, just try something. What's s4? That would be a1 minus a2 plus a2 minus a3, plus a3 minus a4, plus a4 minus a5. Look correct? If so, then I look for the cancellation again, which of course those cancel, those cancel, those cancel. And notice what I'm left with, and I've just gone through both cases here just to make sure the even odd didn't make a difference and it doesn't look like it's going to. It looks like here I have the first term left over and my last term is minus a5 where that index of 5 is one more than what I started with. So again it looks like my s sub n is a1 minus a n plus 1. So here's what we've got the sequence of partial sums for a telescoping series that looks like n equals 1 to infinity a sub n minus a sub n plus 1 is the sequence Sn where S sub n equals a1 minus a n plus 1. All right, now, two things here. Number one, uh, you should see why it's being called a telescoping sum. Because these pairs cancel, you can just imagine those collapsing so that this is like a telescope that folds up where the only thing that's left are the two ends. And then if I look at what the partial sum is, and I ask you what is the limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence of partial sums, 
Well, it's the limit as n goes to infinity of a1 minus a n plus 1, which is, well, let's see, a1 is a constant. And then the question is, what happens as n goes to infinity with this a sub n plus 1? Well, there's only two choices. Either limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 exists, or it doesn't. If the limit of this doesn't exist, then this limit doesn't exist. And therefore, this telescoping series diverges. OK, what if this limit exists? Well, it depends. If that limit is 0, then of course, the limit would just be a1. And my sum would be a1. If the limit is 5, then of course my limit is going to be a1 minus 5, if 5 is the limit of that general term. All right, now let's try the example we talked about just to see this working. And really, once you've seen one telescoping series like the ones we do in this class, you've seen them all. So I'm going to look at the example of n equals 1 to infinity, let's say 5 over 3n plus 1 times 3n minus 2. All right, now, when I look at 5 over 3n plus 1 times 3n minus 2, uh, the first thing that should spring to mind is partial fraction expansion because this definitely looks like it could be something over 3n minus 2 plus something over 3n plus 1. Okay, now if you run the partial fraction expansion, what you'll find is the something for the a is 5 thirds, and the something for the b is minus 5 thirds. Okay, that means this series looks like n equals 1 to infinity, let's say 5 thirds over 3n minus 2 minus 5 thirds over 3n plus 1. Now, here's the curious thing, uh, which I'll mention here in a few minutes. You should remember from Calc 1 that sometimes we can take a series like this, a sum, and if I had two things inside, I might be able to split that up into two summations. And I'll write this again here in a minute, but the question would be, does this converge if these two converge? And the answer is yes. What happens if either one of these two on the right diverges? Then this series diverges. Now in this case, it would mean that if I could split this into two sums, one of them being a 5 thirds over a 3n minus 2, and the other one being a minus 5 thirds over 3n plus 1, then if I could determine this sum and it existed, and I could determine this sum and it existed, then this summation would exist and it would be the difference of these two. And that would be great if I could do that. However, I'll just say that finding the value of this guy, if it exists, is very difficult. And in fact, it turns out that this series actually diverges. And you'll see why in a couple of sections. As a matter of fact, this one also diverges. And when I say diverges, what I mean is if you try to sum up these things, you'll get something infinite, unbounded. And if you try to sum up these things, you will also get something infinite. Okay, what do we know about infinity minus infinity? Well, we know that we don't really know anything. It could be infinity, it could be minus infinity, or it could be some finite limit because this is one of our indeterminate forms that usually we try to apply L'Hopital's rule to. Well, we can't really apply L'Hopital's rule to these sums. Okay, which means I don't really have any chance right now of figuring out 
what this sum is if it exists. And I will say this sum does exist. So what I need to recognize is that this is actually telescope. And if you haven't done these before, then of course you're not going to be looking for them. Once you know what they look like and you know to be on the lookout for them, then once I see a summation that looks like the difference of two things, uh, my first thought is, could this be something that looks like the difference of a function where the function in the first term is evaluated at n, and in the other function, it's evaluated at n plus 1? Well, let's see. The way I wrote them, um, I said 5 thirds over 3n minus 2, and the other one that I wrote second was 5 thirds over 3n plus 1. Okay, for positive n, which one of these denominators is actually the smaller one? Well, it's this one, which is why I put it first. 3n minus 2 is smaller than 3n plus 1. And in fact, notice if I called a sub n 3n minus 2, what would a sub n plus 1 be? It would be 3 times n plus 1 minus 2, which would be 3n plus 3 minus 2, which would be 3n plus 1, which is what you have right here. So actually, if a sub n is 5 thirds over 3n minus 2, then a sub n plus 1 is exactly 5 thirds over 3n plus 1, which means this series we're working on is really a pure telescoping series. Okay, so we've got sort of the, the two basic fundamental examples that most books start with, and they are the common ones because they're the two simplest types of infinite series that actually have fixed formulas for determining their values. A lot of other infinite series that converge uh, either have very elaborate formulas or in some cases don't have exact formulas at all, which means we'll have to do certain kinds of approximations. So the next question is, uh, if, we, if we have a couple of examples of when things do converge, the flip side of that is, do we have ideas of when things don't converge? And for that, I want to talk about uh, two basic examples. And so the first one is something we call the harmonic series. And it's a very important series that occurs all over the place in mathematics, outside of calculus, all over the place. And it's a very simple series. It's the series n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n, which is simply the infinite series whose terms consist of reciprocals of the natural numbers. So 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth plus 1 fifth and so on. So this is a, a very peculiar little series. Um, in fact, let me, let me rewrite the terms here and I'm going to write quite a few of them. So let me at least go out to 1 7th and 1 8th. And then when I get to 1 9th, let me skip a little head and let me jump to the next term where the denominator is a power of 2. So plus dot 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 dot. All right, we'll talk about this a little more in a future section, but uh, notice this is an infinite series that's comprised entirely of positive terms. Um, now, without getting into too much detail at this point, I'll just say that infinite series of positive terms may be rearranged in any way you wish uh, for example using the commutative property of addition the associative property of addition 
and the result will always be the same, i.e., if the series converges, it will converge to the same value regardless of the rearrangement. Okay, now that, that sounds like uh, possibly a, a stupid statement. Of course, when I rearrange the terms in a sum, wouldn't I just get the same sum? If I take 1 plus 2 plus 3, let's say plus 4, when I calculate that by order of operations, what do I do? I add these two first and get 3, then I add 3 and get 6, then I add 4 and get 10. Uh, there's nothing stopping me from changing the order of operations by using the associative property, for example, to add the 2 and the 3 first to get 5, and then order of operations would say I do the 1 and the 4, or the 1 and the 5 first. Well, I know that I could commute these, and then associative property says I could add those two first, and I'd get 1 plus 9, which is still 10. Okay, so obviously, and the key word is here, for finite sums, all of those old things you've always used, as in commutativity, associativity, distributive property, allow you to calculate that sum in many different ways. I will just say, in general, that is not true in general for infinite sums. In other words, something breaks with some of your basic arithmetic properties when the sum is infinite. And what I'm telling you here with this remark is that all of the things that you use when you evaluate sums in different ways will still apply if the infinite series is comprised entirely of positive terms. So what I'm suggesting there is when some of the terms are negative, in particular when infinitely many terms are positive and still other infinitely many terms are negative, then I can actually rearrange this infinite series in different ways to make it converge to different values. And we're not really going to do that in this class. That's, that's more a topic for advanced calculus. But for us right now, it won't be an issue because of what I'm telling you here in this remark. Infinite series of positive terms, in my little example here in the harmonic series, they're all positive. I can rearrange those in whatever way I want. And if this thing converges, it won't matter how I rearrange them. If it diverges, it won't matter how I rearrange them. All right, so what I mean by this is when you normally evaluate a sum, what do you evaluate? You evaluate the first two. And then whatever that is, you add it to the third one and you accumulate your sum in this way. You add that to the fourth one, you add that accumulated partial sum to the fifth one, and so on and so forth. All right, let's try something different instead. Since I can regroup these in any way that I want, uh, let's group these four, ooh, not that one. Let's group these four together. And let me switch colors. Let's group these two together. And let's group these together. And let me just make the remark here. How many terms are there in this first green block? There are two. How many terms are there in that yellow block? There's four. How many terms are there in this block? Well, if you count those up, 1 9th through 1 16th, you'll see there's eight blocks, or eight numbers. Um, if I filled in one more for you here, so let's say I had plus dot dot dot, so obviously the, the next one after 1 16th would be 1 17th. Let's say I went up to the next term that has a denominator, which is a power of 2, which is 1 32nd, plus dot dot dot. Uh, let's make that a blue block, 
if you count those up, you'll see there are 16 terms in that block. And hopefully you see now what I mean by rearranging. If I arrange these in these blocks, I am not following the usual order of operations. I'm adding the 1 and the 1 half. Then I'm adding these two together before I add it to that 3 halves. And then I'm adding these four up before I add it to the first four terms, and so on. All right, let me erase all of this. I think we need that now. All right, very simply, in this first block of two numbers, what's the smallest number of the two? It's the one quarter. So is it safe to say that one-third plus one-fourth is greater than one-fourth plus one-fourth? Where basically what I've done there is replaced this number by something smaller, which definitely makes this thing on the right smaller than this expression on the left. And notice what that thing on the right is. It's two times one-quarter, which is one-half. Okay, what about one fifth plus one sixth plus one seventh plus one eighth? What's the smallest of those four numbers? It's the one eighth. So it should be clear from what I did on the line above that the sum of those four is greater than four times one eighth, since each of those four is greater than or equal to one eighth. And in particular, that's one half. Okay, so if you see where I'm going this, what I'm saying is this little mini block right here has to be bigger than one half. This little mini block here with the four terms has to be bigger than one half. In this next block, there are eight terms. Each of those terms is greater than or equal to one sixteenth. And actually, they're all greater than one sixteenth except for the very last term. Okay, that means again, this block is larger than one half. Okay, now, you should be able to tell from what I've written here that this infinite series diverges. What I'm adding up is three halves plus something bigger than one half 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 and basically, if I continue to group together using the associative property, blocks of terms that are size 2 to the n, then I can basically produce a modified sum where each of the terms are larger than 1 half. Well, what happens if you keep adding up 1 half over and over again forever? You definitely get something that diverges. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger without bound. Okay, therefore, this harmonic series is the first example of a very unusual phenomenon. That is, a series which seemingly, uh, it's a series in which the terms are getting very, very small, but yet this series diverges. So even though these terms are getting very, very small in the sum, they're not getting small fast enough. So we talked about our little analogy of stacking the things to see how high they would stack. Well, obviously these things I'm stacking are getting very, very small, but not small enough. If I keep stacking them forever, I can make it go as high as I want. Now, it's going to take me a long time to make this sum get bigger than, let's say, a thousand. But what we've just shown here is if I go out far enough, I can eventually make this sum bigger than whatever I want. It may take trillions of terms to get it to a, a large size, but it is possible. This series diverges. All right, now that brings us to the last theorem in this section, which is another very important theorem, very simple. And it says the following. If our series a sub n converges, and actually, this one applies whether a sub n is positive or negative or any sign. So this applies to any series. Then the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n must equal 0. Uh, 
Okay, now be careful about what this theorem says. So let's just uh, put a little remark here. This comment says that if your series converges, then that general term, that sequence that is defining the terms in your sum, that general term has to have a limit of zero. Okay, notice that is the same thing as saying that if that limit of that general term is not zero, that is, if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is not zero, that implies that this series diverges. And this is really the, the key use that we want to make of this theorem. This gives us a very easy criterion to tell when a series diverges. If the limit of the general term is not zero, then the series diverges, automatic. Okay, be careful. Again, this is one of these places where you can uh, abuse the logic if you're not watching it. So be careful. Why am I trying to put E's and S's at the end of things? Be careful. The limit as n goes to infinity of that general term being equals zero does not imply anything. Notice the theorem says if the series converges, then the limit of the general term is zero. This thing that I just wrote here, you should recognize that's just the contrapositive of that statement. This theorem comes in the form if a then b, that is, if a series converges, then the general term has a limit of zero. We know the contrapositive of not b implies not a is always true if a implies b. That is, logically, these two statements are equivalent. Okay, what I don't get out of a statement like a implies b is a statement b implies a. I do not know that in general. And in this theorem, B implies A would be the statement, if the limit is zero, the series converges. Um, I know that's not true because what's the example we just talked about? The harmonic series, N equals one to infinity, one over N. The limit as N goes to infinity of one over N is definitely zero, but this series diverges. So the upshot here is knowing the limit of the general term is zero doesn't tell me anything. But if I know the limit of the general term is not zero, I know the series is divergent. Okay, I think what this tells you is from here on out, if you're investigating any series, the first thing you should probably try is this theorem because it's so easy to apply. If you get an answer of limit of zero, then you know you're going to have to try something else to investigate further. If, on the other hand, you get a limit that is not zero, then right away you know the answer is divergent, and you're done. Okay, let's look at the proof of this real quickly, uh, because the proof has a useful device in it that you should see. It gives you a little insight into how this works. So, proof, suppose the a sub n sequence converges. I'm sorry, suppose the series a sub n converges. Then, of course, if we're given epsilon greater than zero, there is some let's say n greater than zero, such that if n is sufficiently large, that is if little n is bigger than that n, then we know what? We can make the value of this series as close to the limit. So of course if I say converges, let's say it converges to L, just to give the limit a name. We know we can make the value of the infinite series as close to that limit as we want. Let's say epsilon. And when I say as close as I want, it means I can make the partial sum as close to 
L as I want. So let's change that infinite series to a partial sum. In other words, if n is sufficiently large, we can make the partial sum as close to L as we wish. And again, what happens if I make this epsilon smaller? Then I may have to make this n value bigger, which means what? I'm just adding more terms to the partial sum and inching myself closer and closer to this limit. All right, now, let's say I've found that n so that this is true. Um, I can certainly make s sub n minus l less than epsilon over 2 just by choosing a larger n. So let's suppose I've done that. So let's suppose at this point, I know that if I go this far in the series, I can make the difference between my partial sum and my value for the series less than epsilon over 2. Okay, now here's something for you to think about for a minute. If this is true, is this also true? We just said that if n was bigger than big N, if n was sufficiently large, then this nth partial sum minus my limit was less than epsilon over 2. Okay, what is this s sub n plus 1? Well, it's just this partial sum with one more term added onto it, right? S sub n plus 1 is just the nth partial sum plus the n plus first term. Well, if the first n terms got me this close to L, wouldn't adding one more term get me even closer? So I would claim that if using this partial sum for an n this big gets me within epsilon over 2 of L, then adding one more term to that partial sum, giving me this slightly larger partial sum, should just get me a little bit closer. All right, so what I've got now is, if I just summarize here, I've got Sn minus L is less than epsilon over 2. But of course, if that's less than epsilon over 2, so is Sn plus 1 minus L. So let's just say those are both true. Okay, note that by what we just said above, a sub n plus 1 in absolute value is just the absolute value of Sn plus 1 minus Sn. Remember what we wrote up here a minute ago, and I erased it, I think, but we said that Sn plus 1, the n plus first partial sum, was just the previous partial sum plus the next term. Okay, notice that Sn plus 1 minus Sn, I could just say that's Sn plus 1 minus, let's say, S, or I guess we're calling it L here, plus L minus Sn. And you can see there I've done the old trick of adding and subtracting L. I could use the triangle inequality to say that that's less than or equal to S sub N plus 1 minus L, absolute value, plus absolute value of L minus Sn. Of course, I know inside absolute values, I can switch the signs around on that and make that Sn minus L. And what do I have up here? I have that when n is sufficiently large, that Sn minus L is less than epsilon over 2, and Sn plus 1 minus L is also less than epsilon over 2. That means this whole thing is equal to epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 which is epsilon, meaning when n is greater than n, we know that a sub n plus 1 is less than epsilon. Okay, that's the same thing as saying the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 is 0. And if a sub n plus 1 goes to 0, a sub n in general goes to 0. All right, so that's the proof of the theorem, and in practice, using this theorem is very simple. Uh, let me give you a couple of quick examples here before we close out. So think about the series n equals 0 to infinity 
let's say, square root of 2 to the n. All right, there are two quick reasons you should be able to tell me that this series diverges. One would be that if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of the square root of 2 to the n, where I know square root of 2 is roughly 1.414, well, if you take something bigger than 1 and raise it to the n, and then let n go to infinity, that definitely blows up. Okay, our theorem that we just proved says that if your series converges, the limit of this general term has to be zero. And the contrapositive of that statement was if the limit of this general term is not zero, the series diverges. The limit of this general term is not zero. This series diverges. Uh, by the way, what's the other way you should be able to tell that this diverges? This definitely looks like a geometric series. And we're saying the common ratio is square root of 2. And if that's 1.4, that's bigger than 1. And we know that geometric series with a common ratio whose absolute value is greater than or equal to 1 diverge. So there are at least two reasons I can quote there for why this diverges. Now, by the way, this, this test that I'm doing, where I take the limit as n goes to infinity of the general term and check to see if that's zero, uh, let's start calling that the nth term test. And this is what he'll call it in the book. And basically, I'm just looking at that nth term to see if the limit of that nth term is zero. And the nth term test says if that limit is not zero, the series diverges. And as I said before, this is probably the first test of the many tests we're going to learn that you probably want to apply first because it's so easy to apply. What about n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times n? Um, if I write out what that looks like, you'll notice that series looks like 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 plus 5 minus 6, plus 7, minus 8, and so on. Uh, by the way, what would happen if I computed this following normal order of operations? Let's see, I'd have 1 minus 2 is negative 1, negative 1 plus 3 is 2, 2 minus 4 is negative 2, negative 2 plus 5 is 3, 3 minus 6 is negative 3, negative 3 plus 7 is 4, 4 minus 8 is negative 4, um, looks like no matter where I stop in that sum, the absolute values of the final partial sum result are getting larger in absolute value. In fact, I can very quickly say what's the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 times n. And I can clearly say it doesn't exist because the absolute value of this thing is just n. And I know n goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. It's just that the signs are alternating. If I look at what the terms are doing, it's if this is 0, the terms are 1, negative 2, 3, negative 4, and so on, alternating back and forth. OK, so by the nth term test, I can say this diverges because the limit of that term does not equal 0. Um, let's look at this example, and this is just the one to show you that sometimes uh, very simple patterns are hidden under just extra notation. So if I look at the series cosine n pi over 5 to the n, um, it shouldn't take you long to realize that for integer values, cosine of n pi is just going to be plus or minus 1. Actually, if n is even, which would be cosine of 0, cosine of 2 pi, cosine of 4 pi, you should see that those are all 1s. If n is odd, as in cosine of pi, cosine of 3 pi, cosine of 5 pi, those are all negative 1s. Uh, so in fact, this is what? It's 1 when n is 0. It's minus 1 fifth when n is 1. It's plus 1 over 5 squared, when n is 2, minus 1 over 5 cubed, plus 1 over 5 to the fourth, and so on. 
All right, now this is an important example to show you the common way that we write terms that alternate in sign like this. I'm going to write this as n equals 0 to the infinity, and I'm going to split this into two parts, which is something we're going to do a lot later in the, in the chapter. I'm going to split it into the one-fifth part, which is 1 over 5 to the n, and you can see clearly that starting at 0, that gets me the 1 and the 1 -fifth and the 1 25th and the 1 1 25th. Okay, what about the alternating part? Well, when n is 0, I have positive. When n equals 1, I have negative. When n is equal to 2, again, I'm back to positive. Okay, meaning I would like negative 1 raised to something so that when n is odd, I get a negative 1, and when an n is even, I get a positive result. And I think you'll notice that if I use n, that would do it. When n is 0 and n is 2 and n is 4, those will all be positive. When n is 1 or 3 or 5 or 7, those are all negative. Uh, notice that this series actually is just n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 fifth to the n. Actually, this is the first time we've seen this, but you do realize when we talked about geometric series, we did say that they would converge provided the absolute value of r was less than 1. Notice that does allow for r to be negative. The common ratio in a geometric series can be negative. Okay, I still use exactly the same formula that I used before. It should be 1 over 1 minus the common ratio, which is minus 1 fifth. So this one's going to be 1 plus 1 fifth. It's going to be 1 over 6 fifths. It's going to be 5 sixths. Okay, it just turns out in this case that if that common ratio is negative, my answer isn't going to be bigger than 1. It's going to be less than 1. Okay, that's enough. Uh, that cleans up all of the basic re results about infinite series, so the introductory theory, and we've gone through geometric series and telescoping series, and now this nth term test. And so once we get through this section, uh, looking ahead to the rest of the chapter, well, not all the chapter, but the next several sections, each of the next few sections is just a different convergence test. There are a series of different tests, and each of these sections will be considerably shorter than these first few sections in Chapter 8 because now that we've got the basics down, now we just specialize and come up with special tests to test for convergence for particular kinds of series, different kinds of functions. So let's stop here for this section, and then we'll start rolling with these convergence tests in the next several sections.